welcome. My name is Julian Schlossberg, and the name of our show is Movie Talk. We're back on Movie Talk for part two of my interview with Ben Mankiewicz. He's now been hired as a host on TCM, and let's find out about that. Tell me, do you remember when you first met Bob Osborne? I probably met him. I don't remember the first time because we were never in Atlanta at the same time. Maybe not never, but maybe never because TCM, pretty small operation. We only had at that point one studio and we didn't even have enough employees to really run two shoots at that point. So if he was shooting, he was there. And if I was shooting, I was there. We worked with the same people, same wardrobe stylist who's still there, Holly Hattesty, same makeup artist, you know, same producers, same teleprompter operator, same director. And they all loved him. So we used to do company retreats like in the first years I was there. So there was probably a retreat in 2004. That's my guess as to when that was. And we should establish that he was the primetime host and you were the weekend host at that point. Is that right? And actually, I was marginalized. I don't mean to say that that negatively, but it was. I was not just the weekend host. I was the weekend daytime host. And like <laughs> years <laughs> later when I was like, hey, can we just lose the word daytime just to make it a little just weekend host? <laughs> and they first said, yeah. And then then they were like, yeah, no, we can't. <laughs> it was the weekend <laughs> daytime host for a while. Yeah. Well, was it? pretty intimidating for you to take over. It was more intimidating in the beginning, knowing that he was there and that, you know, and then like when we started having a festival later, there were a couple things, a couple times I met him, Ted Turner got a star on the Walk of Fame and I got invited to that and Robert was there and, you know, just the way people respected everything he said. And, you know, I just, again, I just felt like this interloper. And and for a while I thought, you know, this is a great job, but I'll never really break through. Right. And in the beginning, and, and he and I really formed something nice, but it took a while. And I get it now because, you know, we've hired these other hosts and I, all of whom I like, not just a little, but I like a lot. They're really all friends, but I don't think Robert liked this young kid coming in. I don't think that was his, was not his favorite development. It had nothing to do with me. He knew Uncle Joe's movie, All About Eve. That's right. That's right. That's right. He may have, he probably thought there was an All About Eve thing happening. I was far too scared to even think about that. And we honored him on the 20th anniversary of the channel in 2014. And I I wrote a thing and it moved him and things had already eased, but he was really, it was very kind about that. It was a nice moment for me. I had a wonderful relationship with him. And where I broadcast, I had a radio show in New York for nine years. But if there was a giant snowstorm, Bob lived across the street from the radio station. And he lived, as you know, in a building called the Osborne. Even spelled the same way. It's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And he had nothing to do with the ownership of that building. Crazy. But what I would do, Ben, you'll get a kick out of this because you do so many interviews. If there was a huge snowstorm and I, you know, got some huskies and got me to the station, I would pick up the phone and say, Bob, put on your galoshes, cross the street and come on over because I was on from eight to midnight. It was four hours and people weren't going to be coming as my guests. But I knew if he came, it would be great. We had a lot of fun. He was a great storyteller. and I can't tell you how it was clear to me that the way everybody at TCM spoke about him then the many people who are still there speak about him now. There was just this reverence for him. And it wasn't, but they also humanized him. I mean, so they were honest about like his foibles and all, and it didn't matter. They were like, he was really great. He was kind to everybody. He made everybody smarter. He was the Walter Cronkite at TCM. I mean, this wouldn't, I wouldn't have this job without him. And he had nothing to do with hiring me, but he created this job. He made it a thing that mattered. So we all owe this enormous debt of gratitude to him. And he was also, as you can, as you know, Julian, he was just, he was just full of decency. Yeah, he really was a fine person. He had the Hollywood reporter, he had the rambling reporter, and he was kind enough to do a lot of stories on me over the years. And so he became a kind of a semi-regular on my show, and I miss him to today. It's time for the family Mankiewicz. You, you've gone this long, and I have to do it, Ben. I know you've never spoken about this at all. No, yeah, I don't like. I'm not. I don't like talking about my family. I know, but here we go. You know, I was thinking that his talk about armchair psychiatry. I'm looking at Herman and Joe, and then I see Frank and Don, and then I see Ben and Joshua, and I say, hmm, here's an interesting thing: two brothers, two brothers, two brothers. Some having sibling rivalry, some having a lot of anger, 
others taking care of each other. But you and Josh seem to have, if you'll forgive me, from a distance, the healthiest relationship. Oh, by far. I, I, I couldn't love my brother more. He's the greatest brother in the world. He's also just a great guy. I mean, his, my brother's friends love him. Everybody loves my brother. If you meet my brother, you love him. He remembers your birthday. He he's he's a he's in, he's uh, first of all he's really great at what he does i mean he is a great interviewer and he sometimes interviews people in very difficult situations he is not afraid he was a great reporter he was a great political reporter so uh he's also spectacularly funny um and clever um and uh you know he uh I mean, he was the best to me as a kid, and he is even now as an adult. And it's always this weird dynamic. I mean, we're, you know, we're however old we are now, you know, where I'm in my 50s, he's in his 60s, and we, you know, but I'm still, you know, there's still this big brother, little brother component to our relationship. But definitely, my brother got, my my dad got along with his brother, Don, but Don was a not an easiest guy in the world always to connect with. Very gifted, smart, funny. Um, and they had a nice relationship, but my brother and I, by far, are the closest siblings. Although my father was incredibly close to his younger sister, uh, Johanna Mankiewicz, who was a gifted, gifted writer who died much too young. And they, they were they were very close, and I would say my my brother and I are more emulate that relationship between. Josie Mankiewicz and, and my father. Well, let's talk in terms of Herman Mankiewicz first. Here is a man who was part of the Algonquin Round Table. A lot of people don't know that. And also a theater critic. He wrote a play that I don't think was very successful, but he was an incredible writer and producer and sadly a very unhappy man. It seems if you one reads the books or does the studies, that part of that was the self-loathing was his father, who was a teacher and seemed to really kind of look down on what Herman was doing. No question. Even if he didn't look down on it, Herman presumed that he was. It was just ingrained in him. You know, the. I mean, now it's hard to imagine. I'm sure there are parents out there who'd be disappointed if their children became successful screenwriters. But most parents would get it, that that's pretty great. Right. It's an incredibly competitive, difficult business to succeed in. And and Herman succeeded wildly in it. But his father came from, it was literally came from the old country, from either Poland or Germany, depending on where the border was at the time, and emigrated to the United States, I think in the 1880s. I might have that slightly wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was the 1880s to Wilkes Barre, Pennsylvania. And he was a professor. He'd been a, I think, a literature German professor. I got, I would have to, revisit a couple of the books to remind me, but he was a, he was a uh, unbelievably scholarly man and, 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 and stubborn and, uh, and judgmental. And, and he thought he had these two kids, both brilliant, both went to college early, both just clearly gifted in Herman and Joe, their, their age difference, almost exactly what me and my brother are about 12 years. And, uh, uh, and, you know, he thought being a theater critic, that's noble. The theater was noble. Uh, writing a play was, was worthy. Even being a writer, even reading, writing a novel would have been great. Certainly writing, being a journalist was okay. But the movies, this, you know, filler for the masses, as as Franz Mankiewicz would see it, uh, was uh, worthless. He thought Joe should be a, a should, should, should teach. Uh, and, you know, he could write, you know, write a novel, you know, or, uh, and, and teach. But again, five, he was incredibly disappointed when Joe followed Herman, uh, out to Hollywood. And Herman, yeah, had this sort of self-loathing that he couldn't shake. And he, you know, he, he drank, really drank himself to death. And he, uh, um, he was a fun drunk by, by all accounts. He wasn't mean, yeah. except to like yeah. Louis B. Mayer and, and, uh, William Randolph Hearst, and it's okay to be mean to them. Was Mank an accurate portrayal from your point of view? As li- I know you didn't know your grandfather, but from what you know, was it pretty accurate, the movie? You know, the details, like the involvement in the, the gubernatorial campaign that's a big part of the movie and the you know progressive candidate for governor, that part clearly wasn't true because Herman w- would never have been that involved in politics that in that way. But he was incredibly political and very aware. Loved it. They, they never talked about movies. My dad always said at home, never talked about the business, no matter who was over. You know, Ben Hecht come over, Harpo Marx come over, and the the the, the talk was always politics, the world. Um, these were serious people. Um, but 
you know, Herman was anti whatever you were and could. So, you know, he, you know, Herman famously, they're sort of correct about the movies that Herman was not a big union guy in those early days, but he was also uh, hated the studio heads. <laughs> so, I mean, like if you were saying, yeah, if somebody had said to him, these unions, they're going to destroy everything. He'd say, what the hell are you talking about? Who's going to fight Harry Cohn and Louis B. Mayer? You're going to think they're going to look out for the little guy, for the working man? You're crazy. The union is the only way to do it. Then if somebody was talking about the unions, he'd be like, hey, you're going to price everybody out of the business. This is crazy. You're going to destroy. He just, you know. Um, but what was accurate, well, the one story about uh, raising money and helping to get uh, Jews out of Germany, that was true. I, I think the movie inflated the number, but he did it, no question, and it wasn't two. Um and uh, so that's an incredible, um, you know, that was a, a real, that's something that he, I hope he was proud of. Um, uh, but what was accurate, I think, based on the way my father described him, and I wish my father had been alive to see it, uh, was I just think that, that Gary Oldman captured the essence of Herman. Like, yes. yeah, I mean, he got that. He was, you know, like you, you see that movie and you think, I bet people like that guy. Right. They wanted to hang out with him. They thought what he said was smart. He was funny. He was mean to the right people. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and he was unafraid. Um, so that part was and he loved his wife. That's all all appears to be true. And he did have great jobs and he did get fired all the time. He got fired all the time. And because, he, you know, I mean, like the great story that, you know, I think he, he wrote the Spanish main and they had a big scene at the end where the boat burned and. They wrote it and then the studio didn't want to shoot it because it cost, you know, whatever, $28,000 to shoot the scene or 38 or make a number up. And Herman was outraged and, you know, so he quit. And then they just hired somebody else to write the scene where they say, oh my God, the boat burned. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah, that one, that cost nothing. So, I mean, like he quit for, you know, like it, uh, get somebody else to do it. And, uh, you know, and then when they asked him to write a, a Rin Tin Tin movie or, I don't put Rin Tin Tin. I'm dating myself. It's probably, uh, they were, but it was a dog. Maybe it was Lassie. I don't think so. I, in my head, it was Rin Tin Tin. Anyway, a, a movie about a dog that, you know, and he was like, I'm not writing a movie about a dog. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so he, he hands in a, a, a early draft of the screenplay where in the first scene, the dog uh, uh, picks up a baby by the scruff of his neck and carries the baby into a burning building. <laughs> that was, that was, <laughs> and like just stuff like that is funny, but it's going to get you ultimately. It's going to cost you your job. Yeah, they're going to get, show you the exit that way. Yes, right. No question. So, talk a little bit, please, about the famous telegram. I guess to Ben Heck, who we should point out was one of the great writers from front page to notorious, just a great, great writer. Yeah. So Ben Heck had been a friend of my grandfather's or Herman's back in New York, and Heck, of course, great playwright, journalist, just a gifted writer, wrote quick and wrote well. And when Herman was writing title cards in Hollywood, he came out there early, just lured by the money. And it turned out to be the money was better than he thought. He basically, I think I have it correct. He wrote to Ben Hecht. He said, it's in the movie, but in the movie, he sends a bunch of telegrams to a bunch of writers in Mank. He really only sent it to Hecht. But anyway, the telegram said to Hecht, there's millions to be made out here. Get out here as soon as you can. Your only competition is idiots. <laughs> Don't let this get around. <laughs> right, <laughs> like you can come, but don't tell everybody. Cause <laughs> keep it between us, yeah. <laughs> like keep it between us. There's yeah, too much right. to be. I don't want a lot of other guys coming yeah, out here from out New York there. taking our jobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you touched on it, but if you'd go a little further on Herman bringing out his brother or encouraging him to come, yeah, yeah. So Herman and Joe, I mean, their relationship soured later when things started to go south for Herman. You know, Herman was comfortable bringing out his brother when Herman was on top of the world. You know, working with the Marx Brothers at Paramount and you know wrangling them and the successful pictures they had there. And and Herman was the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood for a time in the early part of the 1930s. And then, you know, he gambled it all away or gave it all away. He loved lending. People would borrow $1,000 from him. He'd give him 2000 because, yeah. like, you find yeah. 1000 will get you out of your hole, but then you need to, something to kickstart your life. So, uh. and he never cared whether he got paid back. And then when he borrowed, he didn't always pay back. And so, and he gambles. Uh. Uh, so, but yeah, but, but bringing Joe out then was, you know, when Herman was a star, when things started to go south for Herman and then, and Joe ascended. And Joe had a much more successful career overall than Herman. Um, I think that was difficult for 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 Herman, and I think it was difficult for for Joe. I mean, I don't think Joe, you know, I mean, I, I just, you know, I think about me and my brother, and my brother's never, I don't ever think, going to need my help, but like he'd get it without uh, me worrying for half a second. 
you know. So, you know, I, I don't know, Joe, uh, it, it's too bad because they were both brilliant and they clearly at one point, you know, really loved it. And they, to the end, I mean, when, when Herman died, you know, he told Joe to take a look and promised to make him t- take care of, of my aunt, Joanna Josie, who was then, I think she was 16 when her father died. Oh, yeah. So tell me a little bit, if you would, I want to go back to Bob just for a minute, Yeah, to Bob Osborne. When you took over, you're working with writers. They were writing for Bob Osborne. That's not your style any more than his style is your, you know, I mean, just, you have different styles. Yeah, yeah. And they're not, even some of them, it's changed a little bit today. And we have a wonderful woman named Monica Elliott, who now sort of coordinates the script writing for everybody. And I mean, like right now I'm working, I was working on scripts right before you called. Like we had, you know, Debbie Reynolds is our star of the month for March, but a lot of March is spent on 31 days of Oscar. So we're not, we're doing the star of the month thing in March, like the last whole week of March is going to be Debbie Reynolds movies. So I'm working on those scripts. So they've, I get them and they're written. But they're not in my voice, and there's stuff I put in. I spend like anywhere from 15 to an hour on each script. Like, you know, the average I was figure I figure it out a lot is like 23 minutes. So you work on them, and I'm sure Bob did the same thing. He wrote on it. Like you'd see his scripts, and there'd be you know margins. And he'd write you know he'd write down the side with arrows pointing for where things should go, and then they would enter it into the prompter. And I did that a while because that's how Bob did it. And then literally one day in like 2011, I was like, I could use a computer for this, right? <laughs> they were like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. We're talking to TCM host and film critic Ben Mankiewicz. We'll be right back after these words. We're back with TCM host and film critic Ben Mankiewicz. So, you know, we talk about the history of a film before you play it, and I was really fascinated by my favorite, you know, I can't stand it when they say name your favorite movie, your three favorite movies, you're going to a desert island, what are you going to take with you? In those days, when they used to ask me that, I'd say 35 millimeter prints are too heavy to take to the island. So you know, try to get out of it that way. But I, I do want to ask you, if I could, when you see a film like Casablanca, which we all love, and many people like myself, let's just say I can't think of anything I would want to change in that movie. Watching movies as you do all your life and I my life, I often will say, God, I, I would have gotten out of this scene faster. I would have taken this one out. Casablanca, I don't say that about anything there. But I am interested in the fact that George Raft, once again, who kept turning down the best movies, this pants career, what he turned down could have made him the biggest star in the business. Yeah. Maltese Falcon, and High Sierra, and now Casablanca. But then you've got Reagan, Ronald Reagan turning it down. And then you have Well, let me let me interrupt you because it's you're right and not right. About Reagan, I know, yeah. Well, and it's unclear whether Raft turned it down because they sort of knew he'd turn it down. So the question would have been like they might it might have what's very clear is that as soon as Hal Wallace got the treatment from the script reader, like or you know, the script reader read it and had his notes like this would be great, and he has it, it'd be perfect for Bogart or, or Raft in his notes. Like Wallace read it and was like Bogart right away. That's who he wanted. So I don't know how he got around the Raft thing, but he wanted Bogart for it. And it was like a foregone conclusion that Raft would say no. And so who knows how they presented it to him if they had, right? if they did. Reagan was, it's a wonderful thing to speculate about because it would have changed American history if Reagan had gotten Casablanca. Because I think he meant the movie still would have been really good and he would have been a bigger star and he may never have left, right? He may never have you know become governor, which means he's never president which means George H.W. Bush is probably never president <laughs> and, and his son. So his son's never president and we never have the Iraq war. Like yeah. that's, that's this fun little thing that I, that got me booed in Atlanta <laughs> at an event. The fact is he may never have made Santa Fe trail if we were lucky. That's right. That's right. So I, who knows, but even great movies, like a movie that's really also perfect, like the best years of our lives, like at the end of the movie, when Dana Andrews and uh, Teresa Wright are kissing, right. And Frederick March is there. who's Teresa Wright's uh, father. And, and I want to go back in time and give William Wyler a note. <laughs> Right. I think March, given that he was, you know, resistant to that relationship, but he now he should see it. He's there. And I feel like he should see it 
and should just, you know, he doesn't have to nod or anything. He doesn't have to be corny, but just a moment where he sees it and something, because he's the, he was, you know, he and Spencer Tracy to me are like the greatest actors who ever lived and that he should just look at it and be like, oh, okay, this is okay. Like I know this guy and that's my daughter and it's okay. This is how it should be. But that's, and then in Casablanca, just because you brought it up. I just want, and I know it's the production code. Bergman takes out the gun. She points it at Bogart and he begs her to shoot him. And then she breaks down. I can't, I left you one. I can only leave you again. I said, you know, and then there it goes to black and then we come back and he's staring out the window and they obviously slept together. Right. Um, but they can't do that. I just want one button on his tuxedo undone. <laughs> Ideally I, the bow tie would be hanging down. Right. That's all we would need. Just the bow tie hanging down, suggesting that he had put his clothes back on. That's what I want. That, that's my one. That's my one note to Michael Curtiz for Casablanca. I think you're just pushing too much, Ben. I, that's too far. It's I, too think, much, yeah. I think this is really too far. Now, you know, it's funny. I spent a lot of the last couple of days looking at all the interviews you did. And on one of them, which really got me laughing, you said Eva Marie Saint owes me a favor. And like some interviewers, we never found out what it was. You said it. They asked another question. Do you want to reveal what that is? How would Eva Marie Saint, who I adore and who I must say, I have to say, is a big fan of mine. She was, by the way, a huge, great, close friend of Robert Osborne. She and Bob were incredibly close. So actually sort of meant a lot when she connected with me. Like even before he did, she was like, she blessed me which was really nice. Um, I don't know what the favor is. I can't, you know, but we, I once, every time I interviewed her and I'd wear like a nice shirt and jacket, but jeans, she would like my mom, she would be like, I can't believe you're wearing jeans. Right. <laughs> so she, yeah. we had her at the TCM film festival and, and uh, I come out and I'm, and I'm wearing jeans and I know she's just going to say it and I got a tie on everything. And she's like, she's like, well, even for the film festival, you couldn't, you couldn't see yourself yeah. to wear a proper pair of pants. You have to wear jeans. And then I unbutton, I unbuckle the pants and I unbutton them. And she's like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I take my (laughs) shoes off and I take my pants off and I have the suit pants on underneath the jeans. (laughs) It's a very nice moment there. But it was uh, like an Eva's howling, Eva Marie's howling. You can't call her Eva. She'll always point out it's Eva Marie. Well, you know, about the casting, I did a little research myself on Barefoot Contessa do you know that Bogart was not the first choice on that? That sounds right. I don't recall that. I think I've told that story before, but but who was the first choice? Gary Cooper. That makes sense. You don't think of Bogart also as a, although I'm not sure I think of Cooper either, as a Joe Mankiewicz character. No, either of them. But it was interesting. Now, I understand why he wanted James Mason for the role that Rosanna Brazzi ended up doing. That really made sense to me. You know? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Well, Mason, Mason was a, I mean, that's like a gifted, gifted, gifted actor. Yeah. A guy who could be so likable, but then is so wonderfully duplicitous. Yeah. And even when he's the bad guy, you don't fully hate him. It's true. And I had him on the show. I, I'm sure you've had this happen. I would sit across from Betty Davis or James Mason or John Houston, and I'd be asking questions and thinking to myself, I'm sitting across from Betty Davis and John Houston and James Mason. I mean, it would be incredible for me. And then Bob Hope and George Burns, and I I couldn't believe it. And to this day, years later, I'm in my 80s, and I'll say the same thing. Do you have that feeling at times? Yeah, it doesn't really go away. I mean, just this in the last week, the last six or seven days, at Bill Hader and Billy D. Williams, uh, not together. That would be a fun pairing, but yeah. <laughs> they were separate. And both times, I thought this is such a great job, right? It just it just occurs to you. It strikes you in the middle of things. I just I'm looking at a text I got now for a whole other project I'm doing. Uh, Morgan Freeman wants to do next week, and I'm like, how great <laughs> that I you know that I, I I don't know that I can figure out how to do it, but I'll find a way. I'm not gonna not not gonna spend whatever it is like an hour and a half with with Morgan Freeman. So yeah, I'll figure it out. Tell me a little bit about writing. Do you want to write a novel, do, or have you written a novel, or where are you with writing? It's it's certainly in your blood. It's in my blood. I'm okay at it. I'm very slow. You know, it's taken me a long time to figure out that like the rules are only rules and let, until you break them, right? And so that. You know, the way I talk, I'd have to write a novel the way I talk, right? It's just, and and I wouldn't be the first to write a novel that way. So I think about it. I have some people, you know, who encourage me to, um, which is really nice. 
Um, I have no idea whether it would be any good at all. Um, I would, whether it's a novel or whether it's a, you know, some book about movies that, you know, we could, I could trick people into buying. Um, um, uh, but I would like to write a book. I would, that's a feeling I've, I've had a couple of, uh, I've had some very smart friends uh, write books and some less smart friends write books. And if they hear this interview, I hope they'll wonder, hey, which group am I in? <laughs> um, and I, but some of them are like, well, if this guy wrote a book, uh, I could write a book. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I actually ended up writing one or two books. I've finished my second. And the idea for me was I called it Try Not to Hold It Against Me. A producer's life. Yeah, that's good. It's a good title. Yeah, it's a good I title. Thought. It was kind of fun. I have, a, I have a great friend who's written a couple of books named Teresa Strasser, and she's a, a wide door. And uh, she did radio for a long time. She was Adam Carolla's co host, one of his co hosts for years and years and years, and then went into TV. And uh, it's just so hard. And I am, I, I must say, I, this job, when I got it back in 2003, this TCM job was. It's pretty sweet. Like, I don't know. I worked like I worked on the scripts and I'd go shoot every like six weeks. It was like the easiest job in the world. And now I work, I don't know, 60, 70 hour weeks are not unusual. It's not every week. Sometimes I can follow a 70 hour week with a 40 hour week, but it's hard. Like I literally see this thing about Morgan Freeman wants to do next week, you know, and I'm like, oh, that is going to be yeah, hard because there's going to be hours and hours and hours of preparation before I interview Morgan Freeman. Right. I'm not going to, you can't let Morgan Freeman come on and wing it. Right. You've got all these things. You can't, you got to watch some scenes. You got to remember, I want, there's a scene in Brubaker with Robert Redford with Freeman that I know I'm going to want to like reference also because it'll tell him that I watched everything, you know, and I, <laughs> but it's hard. Like, you know, you, you, you got to re- you can't read the Wikipedia page and then jump into an interview. No. And in, in fact, when you read the Wikipedia page, you may find out you're getting it incorrect. That's right. It could send you down in the wrong direction. That's right. I mean, for example, just on that, I was told the two brothers, Joe and Herman, did 200 movies between them. Then I read the book by Miss Stern about the brothers Mankiewicz. Yeah. She says 150. That's a pretty, at 25%, you know, decrease immediately. I mean, it's probably closer to 200, I'm guessing, because of the number of movies that they both worked on where they were uncredited. But that's, yeah. you know, and and that, um, by the way, that book is wonderful, and I'm glad you read it, but uh, my cousin, Nick Davis, who's also Herman Mankiewicz's grandson and Joe Mankiewicz's nephew, uh, Josie Mankiewicz's uh, and Peter Davis's kid, he wrote a book called Competing with Idiots, taken from yeah. the letter about Herman and Joe. And it's, it's more personal, you know, because Nick's part of the family, and it's great. It's a really wonderful Whoa. book about Herman and Joe, really about the nature of that relationship. And it's a very different read than Sidney Stern's book, which is also good. Well, I'm anxious to talk to you about the controversy about the writing of Citizen Kane, which I know you've spoken about a lot, but I'd like my audience to know from your point of view what should be known about who wrote it and how great it is, and you can't take one away from the other. You can't take both their contributions away. No. Well, first of all, the debate about who wrote the script is a little silly in the sense that it obfuscates what should be very clear. It's Orson Welles' movie. And I think we're all very grateful in the Mankiewicz family for Pauline Kael. But the mere fact that she... Her dismissiveness about Wells' talent was the problem with that. And I think that's what got the hackles up of so many Wells acolytes was that it seemed to like, disregard him, that it was just like Robert Wise and Greg Tolan and Herman Mankiewicz who came together and put that movie together. And, you know, I mean, he produced it in the face of these tremendous headwinds and the performance is amazing. And he directed it and he contributed a little bit to the screenplay, but he made it all happen. He, and he was 24. It's a, an amazing accomplishment. It is, it is his movie in the sense that he directed it and had a hand in everything. We overstate the role of directors always, right? This is a collaborative art form. And the screenplay of Citizen Kane is critical to how great it is. And almost all the screenplay was written by my grandfather. It's my understanding of it. You know, the people who who were there, Rita Alexander, his secretary. And and Herman never even really bragged about it. You know, he just, he was proud of it. And Orson, you know, liked to overstate his, you know, he was under tremendous pressure too. And I love Orson Welles. I love Orson Welles. And again, let's not mistake it. Orson Welles is moved, 100%. No question. But let's also not mistake the fact that Herman Mankiewicz wrote it. Yeah, Herman Mankiewicz wrote almost all of it, you know, and Welles culled it down and did a brilliant job in culling down a big screenplay. And Kazan, who I mentioned earlier, told me that for many years, nobody really did that, that directors, often real good ones, would work on a script, but they would not take credit. And he was was saying to me that he was annoyed that he hadn't. He said, I should have. He said, because there were a lot of the films I really was the co-writer. So it's interesting that that 
came out from him. I was surprised that he told me that. Yeah, that, that's an honest thing to reveal. Did you like him? Oh, I was crazy about him. He was my mentor. He was the first person to believe in me. And Ben, you, you'll be uh, surprised to hear this, but he was so hot after On the Waterfront and having won the uh, Academy Award before that, not only for On the Waterfront, but Gentleman's Agreement, that Jack Warner wanted him so badly that they made a deal that he'd make a three-picture deal with Warners, and at the end of 10 years, the films would revert to Kazan. Wow. To Kazan. And that was Face in the Crowd, Baby Doll, and America, America. And that's how I ended up being the worldwide distributor for almost 35 years on a handshake with Kazan. We never had a contract. Never. That's nice. So, you know, I have issues with the way he talked about the Blacklist stuff, but of course, I don't even really mind that he did it because I always want to remember who the real bad guys were, right? And real bad guys were the people who put people like Kazan in that position. I just wish he hadn't bragged about it in the way he bragged about it with On the Waterfront, but that in the book. But what I was just talking to, this will make, but I was, it was for TCM. So I, I finally got a chance to, we got Spike Lee who came in and did a couple of movies for a couple of things we have coming up this year. And, and we talked about A Face in the Crowd and Ace in the Hole, Billy Wilder's film with Kirk mm -hmm. Douglas from 1951. And what struck him was that Billy Wilder made Ace in the Hole, which did very poorly, right? Nobody saw it. Nobody wanted to see this depressing take on American media and American crisis culture. It was the movie he made after Sunset Boulevard, right? He's Billy Wilder. He could make anything, and he made this. And the movie that Kazan made after On the Waterfront was Facing the Crowd, which also didn't do any business and nobody wanted to see or hear. And that these guys who could do anything they wanted chose to do these incredibly bold, prescient, observant stories about what's wrong with us, I think is really telling about both of them. Well, you know, as you know, they tried everything on Ace in the Hole. They called it the Big Carnival. They tried to change the title. Yeah. But all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do it. But what a movie that is. That movie yeah. is sensational. And I believe Face in the Crowd is one of the best. I asked Kazan, you, you'll like this. I said, what's the, anything about Face in the Crowd you don't think works? He said, I couldn't get Andy Griffith at the end to be mean. So I said, well, what did you do? He said, I took him to the Jack Daniels School of Acting. <laughs> <laughs> and he says he's drunk in that scene. He is drunk. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's, I've seen it so many times. I just saw it. Barry Levinson came on TCM to talk about it. We'll have that on in a particular context later this year. It's just amazing. It's so perfect. And there's so many things I forget about it. Andy Griffith is so good. I mean, it's so good. And he is mean in it. You know, he's got this passive aggressive cruelty sometimes, but he is, it's amazing that that guy is known to everybody is just, you know, as Andy Taylor is, uh, I almost find it regrettable, even though clearly Andy Griffith had the career that he wanted to have and God bless him. But man, he could have, he could have been a movie star. Oh yeah, he sure could have. I gave Kazan his 90th birthday party and Andy flew up. Oh, that's so nice to hear. I love that. Every time I opened my front door, Ben, I couldn't believe who was coming into that door for his 90th birthday party. So, yeah, I mean, look, there's no, I'm not apologizing in any way. Naming names is a horrible thing. But, you know, we all hope we would do better than that. But sometimes you just don't know what you'll do. It's the same in war. That's right. I love that about the movies. The guy who's been the kind of coward all of a sudden becomes the hero. And the macho guy all of a sudden starts to cry. So it's an interesting thing, human behavior, as we know. I, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan, and there's a and it was doing an interview years and years ago, 25 years ago, it must be, I think. It's in a compilation of interviews of Bruce that I read it, but it with Nick Hornby, the writer, wonderful writer, Nick Hornby. And there was a lot of talk about this was far before gay marriage, but there was still it was during a some particular part of a gay rights debate. And Bruce had just had it, maybe he had his first kid or second kid, third kid, something like that. And Nick had Asked him, you know, what do you think? You, would you, you're talking about gay rights. You think you'd be comfortable with your, uh, if it turned out one of your sons was gay? And Bruce said, I don't know. I hope so, but I don't know how I'd be. I hope I'd do the right thing, but I won't know until I'm put in that position, which I thought was a really great, honest answer. That's a great, honest answer. I uh, did the only movie with him, you know. I co produced and co directed No Nukes. Oh, wow. Well, wow. I have it. It's the artist that, you know, whatever. There's no amount of shows that I could see that wouldn't move me, right? The way yeah. that, the way art is supposed to move you. So I've yet to have a picture to hang on my wall, the painting that moves me. 
you know, some many movies do, but man, a three hour, two and a half hour Springsteen concert just did whatever, just every time. Doesn't matter whether I've seen the exact same show the night before, I still get moved. Well, I was there for five nights in a row in Madison yeah. Square Garden. I had nine cameras. Haskell Wexler was my DP, but he hired the greatest documentary film people, and we had three definite positions and six roving cameras and we had thunder road we had he introduced the river that night first time right because it was 79 before the album came out on the nose ben i have a hunch i've met my match have you seen it again <laughs> did you watch it because it what was it last year or a couple years ago that it got released the funny thing is about that i've made some movies and it's tough because rarely do you have exactly what you wanted. Either as a producer, you had to go along with the director. In this case, I was co-producer and co-director. There's a couple of things in there that it's hard for me to watch because I didn't want it in there. It's still there. I can't get rid of it. So no, I haven't seen it in a while, but I'm very proud of it because I worked a year with my co-producer and director, Danny Goldberg, and we took no money. And I think it's one hell of a good movie. It is. The, the Springsteen component of it is just, it's just great to see yeah. and, you know, and see him so young and, and, and vibrant. And anyway, it's great. It's a great, great, great thing to watch. Well, thanks. Now tell me if you will, what can we talk about the future? I know you're not leaving TC. TCM, God help us. No, 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 no. Thankfully, uh, things came, it was a good year for TCM. It, it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, we weren't used to being in the headlines as much as we were uh, last summer, but all came out okay. And we got the great assistance and support from so many people in the Hollywood community, you know, namely Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg, Paul Thomas Anderson, but so many other filmmakers really stepped up for us and things are good now. And we're doing a lot of stuff. Um, that's why I'm so busy working these incredibly long, but satisfying hours. So uh, things are good. We got, I got a new podcast out now. I've done the plot thickens for, for four seasons. We have a fifth season of that coming out later this year. It's going to be really good. But I have a podcast that we're doing TCM in conjunction with Max called Talking Pictures, which is the first season is me and uh, uh, 10 filmmakers just talking about movies and movie memories, movies they've made and then movies they've loved and why. And it's really fun and interesting. Mel, as we record this, I don't know when you're going to air this, but as we record this, the Mel Brooks episode is out. Cord Jefferson came out last week. Emerald Fennell, Nancy Myers. Uh, we opened. We opened with Nancy Myers. Steven Soderbergh also. Uh, Alexander Payne. You know, Bill Hader. Uh, it's really. Uh, uh, these, you know, it's these interviews. They're great. It's to be able to sit down for. I mean, they end up. The shows are like 45, 50 minutes, but the interviews are. You know, I go long. <laughs> There's just been great sitting down in, in this relaxed format where you don't have to put makeup on and. And there are no lights, and you just get to talk about movies. It's with people who, who are passionate and love these movies. It's great. Yeah. Well, what's so great about TCM, and I know you've said this before, so I'll steal it and say, nobody ever yells, oh, I can't watch every show on ABC. But boy, on TCM, we are hooked. Those of us who love it, and I'm one of them, boy, do I love that channel. And I always feel, here I have a choice of 417 channels, and I can't find anything. And I run to TCM and say, whatever it is, let me hit there for an hour or two and see what they're doing. You know, it's part of people's identity. That's, uh, and again, as I, you, you quoted me correctly, nobody says that about any other channel. You know, you might like stuff on that channel. Like, I mean, I like a lot of shows I like on Showtime. For somebody, uh, what do you watch? I go, oh, I love Showtime. They look, <laughs> they look at you like you were crazy. <laughs> I love show, right? You know, but TCM, those, they mean something to people. And, you know, I mean, most people have no idea who I am or what I do. But man, the people who watch, they care a lot. And being able to, I mean, Julian, it's not really fair. I mean, I, I get these people who thank me. I started this interview by talking about people thanking my father when we'd be at the grocery store in Washington, D.C. when I was a kid every week. And people come up to me and thank me and they're thanking me for Ilya Kazan and they're thanking me for Michael Curtiz and they're thanking me for John Ford because I talk for two and a half minutes before Casablanca. Like that job, I mean, it's so set up to succeed. So I'm super, super fortunate. Maybe so, but I think you're being not fair to yourself, but therefore I know you're a shy kid still somewhere. <laughs> so the answer is 
what you do is you make us want to watch that movie. You get us excited about that movie. Your passion, your excitement, your enjoyment, how you feel about it is translated over that screen. And I think that's what they're saying. They're also saying, thanks for my memories of my mother or me or my grandmother or whatever. That's right. No, that's, that's you're exactly right. Thanks for making me think about my grandparents, even if I never saw this movie with them. Thanks for making me think about my dad and think about my mom. Yeah, that's right. That's what these movies do. Pretty powerful. It's true. It is powerful. So we've done it, Ben Mankiewicz. I can't thank you enough. I hope one day we actually can sit down and talk in person. But until then, I thank you for joining me today. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Julian. Thanks for joining us on Julian Schlossberg's Movie Talk. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.